So I think we're ready to start if everyone's comfortable. Please come closer if you'd like to. You can sit on the pillows even at the front if you want or lie on them. Um, so I'm talking today to Joanna Tagada Hofbeck. Thank you for being here, for driving from the countryside to, to be in London for the night. Um, so Joanna, for those who don't um, know her work, she works in many different disciplines and mediums, so from painting to photography, sculpture, um, many different things. But I think what's interesting about your work as well is the process itself and the emphasis you put on, you know, not only what you make, but how you make it and how it's also um, then presented to the public, so not just in the form of exhibitions. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so you've exhibited widely in the US, in the UK, Japan also, where you've spent quite a bit of time um, and that has a certain, um, let's say, relationship with your work as well. And Joanna is also the lead artist at Camden Art Centre's learning programme at the moment and the founder of the Gardening Drawing Club, which we're going to hear more about today also. So um, you asked me to start by defining a couple of terms. Um, and I guess these are three sort of guiding principles in your work, in a way. Um, and they deal with sort of the practical, um, the sort of personal, internal, and also like other people. So the first term is permaculture, which I'm going to, um, I'm sure there's many more experts on this than I am um, here, but I'm going to loosely define it as um, growing ecosystems that can be self-sufficient and sustainable. And it's kind of taking nature's lead in a way. Is that right? Have I got that right? Um, and so the three kind of core um, ideas would be um, earth care, people care, and fair share. And then you're also um, adhering to deep ecology as a philosophy, um, which kind of considers all all life is equal, so human life is equal to every other component in this ecosystem. And uh, art therapy is the third term, so this is a form of psychotherapy where um, art making, so sculpting, painting, drawing, can be used therapeutically as um, you know, a form of healing or remedially, also diagnostically. So my first question is, what was your early life and your background like, you know, growing up and how, you know, because you have this very specific way of working and thinking and approaching art. So where did that all kind of originate and come from? So can everyone hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'd like to add as well, so I'm not English, is in, English is in my first language. So if I do make any error, please bear in mind that English is not all my first language. Um, so I'm from France from a region that borders Germany and Switzerland that is known as Elsass. Um, and I grew up there in the countryside in a small village with about a thousand people maybe now. And I have a mixed background, so I'm not just white French, I also have North African ancestry, amongst other. And I grew up speaking different languages, including dialect, which is the dialect of Elsass, known as Alsatian, which is similar to High German in some form. So I grew up there with my grandparents, mostly, who were growing all their food, that means their fruit, their vegetables, their nuts, their teas, and were trading all other things that they didn't have. So that's how I grew up, and that was very influential for me, and there was lots of craft around me, things I didn't notice at the time because they were normal. So even having food from the same land we were living was just normal to me. And that really changed when I moved to the city for studies. And I was obviously very eager, as you can imagine, when you spend 18 years in the same village. And your door to the world is a library with things about Japan, England. You know, it was really like an excitement for me to go to fine art school in the city. And I lived then in, in, after that in Switzerland, in Germany, and came to England, I think, eight years ago now with my husband. And actually, I came to Tate Modern in 2004 and I bought this book uh, of Artis Yoshtu Monara, which I kept. So I had a bit of pocket money and I was 14 years old and we came here with you know, the English class and I had the chance to assist uh, Yoshtu Monara uh, in a show in London when he was here. So maybe 2013 or 14. And that's also the time where the Tate Modern actually starting to sell my publication, which was also very meaningful. I've always been making zines where I was showing like my paintings, there's some in the background 
and other things. And that books as well, and you've got and a magazine as well. That yeah. You also, yeah, like yeah. a tea magazine. Um, and I always loved languages and plants, so that's something that always meant a lot to me. And maybe about the difference of medium, so I've, I've danced from age three to 18 at school. I've had a heavy background in dance, and this movement going from one place to another, I think really influenced how I work with medium, because I don't see them as disconnected things, but I move from maybe photography to painting to natural dye to gardening as if they were one dance and they're all very connected and one languages rather than things that are very distinct and that are hard to access. So there's been a lot of like fluidity for me and, and fun. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's um, when, we, when I mentioned about um, the sort of process being really part of the work and an important like, way of understanding what you're doing. It's not just you make this, you make this. It's just kind of how it all connects and then connects back to these other ideas yeah. um, that we kind of defined at the start. So can we talk a bit more? Um, and also I have to say, I'm so impressed that you've kept this since you were 14 <laughs> years old and it's like in mint <laughs> condition. Um, so can we t um, talk a bit more about your process and this idea um, of creating with nature? Because you, you, you mentioned to me before how when you were seeing this exhibition of Hilmar Klint, that um, it kind of made you reflect on your own ideas about nature um, being sort of intertwined with your with your practice. Can you talk a bit more about that and about this project um, that I find really fascinating of yours um, called Pensez, Manger, Partager, which, I, if I may oh, translate I like, it, it is um, <laughs> to think, to eat. Well, eat, think, share, yeah. right? Which trans translate as. Can you, can you talk a little yeah. about that? So I think now we see a lot of things that um, using terms such as inspired by nature or just words like that, as if nature wasn't us as human. And that's what really drew me to deep ecology because deep ecology is about human as a part of nature. So there is no disconnection. So we couldn't actually be not inspired by nature because we are, us as human, we're nature. So when I am with someone in a cafe or with you, I am also with nature, and so I am when I'm with myself. So in my work, when I say that there is an inspiration to nature, it's actually also to you, to people, to like communities and to myself, to the people I grew up with. And it's not just to nature as defined by plants or a landscape or animals. Of course, those things inspire me deeply, but they're not the only thing that inspire me. And I think that what we see today, and it's a bit dangerous, because rather than bring us closer to nature, it actually deepens the sort of, the, like, the, the gap that there is between us and animals or the landscape or plants. Because when we say we're inspired by them, that means that we have, or we have no relation with them already. We already cut that. And I thought that more and more things today are being created that way or presented that way. And that is very dangerous because the same way with the climate change, when we say that we need to rescue the earth, it actually is for our own benefit. And that is very dangerous because we don't realize how connected we are. And I think that's something that inspires me a lot across different philosophies, such as the ecology, but also spiritual movement, or just different writing and culture across the world, which recognize that we are, us as human, a part of nature. And that is something that in my work is very important. So I make with plants, but I also make a lot with people. So I collaborate. I think there must be about 20 or more collaboration every year with different makers, artists. And Pensez, Manger, Partager is one of these big collaboration projects. So it means um, to think, to eat, and to share. And uh, essentially, I think we'll come to it at some point. So this is a bit in a random order, eventually. <laughs> So Pensez, Manger, Partager is a series of installations where I collect textiles that are unwanted. And I started with a lot of turban because my husband is Sikh and there is lots of fabric in the Sikh culture, so a lot of then unused fabric. And so is then people's homes. And usually they are scared and it's actually a, quite a strong example of fashion today, how much we produce and we end up not using or just not looking after. So I collected this fabric and I dyed them using the leftover from what we cook. And a lot of the food that we cook at home is food we grow. So there is onion skin, avocado pits that we don't grow, obviously. <laughs> and there is like, you know, the, when you make jam, there is all sorts of like potato peels, carrot peels. And so I dye with them. And with time, I end up having piles of colored fabric that I then assemble as form of patchwork and create some fairly large tents where people can then sit and I invited to reflect on different things and subject matters. And one of them was made recently 
uh, for Deptford X at Lewisham Art House with uh, the architect Takashi Hayatsu, where we used uh, English hazel wood and we tied the fabric around. And I think this time we could have about 18 people maybe in the space. So it's something I keep on doing and it's, it's not a form of painting per se, but it's the creation of color that also I then use within my, my paintings. And you had another work like that safe space, right? So it's also yeah. this kind of idea of creating these actual like physical structures where people can reflect and, and but also how do you take that a step further and like that, that had an audio element to it as well. Do you yes. want to just briefly describe that work a bit um, um, yes. or what your aims were with that work? So safe space was a series or is, it kind of got stopped a bit by the pandemic. It's actually shown at MK Gallery in the UK and during the pandemic they had to just uh, redraw the headphones and everything that was the touching element. So Safe Space was a series of paintings of women drinking tea. So you usually see the hands, maybe a bit of the mouth, quite cropped very closely and there was women drinking tea with the hand and the audio recording, they were always my friends or women I knew or had worked with and somehow gained a sense of intimacy and having comfortable conversation. And each painting had an audio recording that could be put on with a headset and listened to quite intimately, so you could really get in the painting rather than feeling in the, at time, intimidating gallery space. And I, because I don't come from a background, I didn't say that earlier, but my parents, so my grandparents work with the land, but my grandparents both work at a factory. So I don't come at all from a wealthy family who has deep connection with the art world, actually quite the opposite. It's quite amazing that I'm really here today and you know, being able to talk about my work and doing what I love. And so I thought that with that theory and my work in general, it's also about making people who are maybe less used to being in an art space and less used to being fancy, just feel welcome and feel connected. So that theory was made to that. And there was also an element of food, which was tea, that was added. And yeah, so that theory, I hope to continue it slowly, slowly and have the chance to show it again. I think this is incredibly relevant right now in the, all the discussion about access, like accessibility to the arts and like all these kind of surveys showing the demographics of people in the art world that um, if we keep presenting um, the same kind of work in the same kind of way, it's not going to attract different people to kind of feel welcome, like you said, or to, to actually be able to come to places to see and experience art in different ways. So I think you kind of doing that making that step, you know, building these kind of structures or going out into the community um, is really important and other people should kind of be taking mm -hmm. note of what you're doing in that, that sense as well. Um, and one of the projects that you um, do as well is the, that we, we mentioned earlier at the start that you founded is the Gardening Drawing Club. So that's like a really good example of this, right? Um, yeah. can, you, can you tell me how you came to found that and, and mm -hmm. what's going on with it? So the Gallon Drawing Club is an art project that is now taking quite a bit of time. It's a real passion. So it brings together two things, art and horticulture. And I realized during the pandemic, how, how always art has been so good for me when I was anxious, when I was stressed, when I just needed a sort of outlet, even to reach out to people and to you know, collaborate. That was always like a great, a great reason. And likewise with gardening, it's something I've loved doing with my parents and my grandparents and my friends. And I realized that living in the city, how people were disconnected. Not, it's not like something that I blame. It's just those are the circumstances. In London, you could literally buy anything at any time if you wanted to and if you have the means. But it wasn't really realizing that, you know, it might take nine months to grow broccoli or, it, you know, just this idea of time and how much work and love it takes to grow food and plants as well, like even ornamental plants that, you know, the way we buy flowers at every season, but what is the true cost of that for people? and having the chance to know a little bit about how to grow plants, I wanted to create a project where people could have access to this, but for free. Because now it's obviously it's a trend, which I think is a great trend that you know there is so much about gardening and green space, and we talk about like, ecology, but often shallow ecology. And I wanted to create a project where people could have all this for free and that they don't have to pay a 50 pound entry at a museum or at a cultural place to learn how to plant a tomato seed and to do a drawing because I think we should actually learn this in school. It's something that we know we need to survive and it's something that we will need even more going forward. So I just decided to use a bit of my savings because that product does need money and you know it still does. <laughs> so like we're finding places so um, we have an assistant with this project and 
basically any place that is open to us, willing to give us a room for free, sometimes a budget, sometimes not, that can be a temple with a garden, it could be like a mosque with a garden, a church, it could be a community center, a community garden, a museum, an art center. I mean, we have had so many of all of these over the last year, like opening up you know, a room for us, and then we meet there, and we have about seven different workshops that we then carry on. So we have one hour to two hours together with, with people who come. We usually have about 30 participants, and all workshop we had, I think, 27 since last April. We're always fully booked with long waiting list. And it's been so nice. Obviously, Dick really took me out of the studio and out of my own allotment. But, so I've invested a lot of time, and I've been painting less myself. But I really do think that those moments are so rewarding that when I see those people, I really feel like they're like living painting, that the scenes I might be, I've seen some in the background where I'm painting my friends or my family in the garden, I feel like those are actually moving paintings. And it's been, it's been really fun, so I'm really happy to do this project. Yeah, because we were, we were discussing about how kind of paintings at the core of your practice, right? And this, you see this as kind of one of, uh, as a painting in a sense, in like a sense, an extension yeah. of that, which I think was a really beautiful <laughs> way of describing it as well. Have you got other projects that, um, that you want to mention that like that? Like you, you also talked to me before about um, the magazine that you do and that also being kind of a way that people can access um, mm. something, you know, without having to, to travel, to move, to be in the city or etc. Do you want to, you know, because I, th I think this is important as well in the way that you're trying to build communities in your practice and kind of really... I don't know, get, get people to like, approach your work in a holistic way, I guess. Yeah, so I think before doing the Garden Drawing Club, and it's something we're still doing, very slowly, but it's coming. So uh, in 2018, I published the first issue of a magazine called Journal du Thé, which is about contemporary tea culture. It was uh, co-founded with my dear friend, the graphic designer Tillman S. Wendelstein. So it's a magazine about contemporary tea culture, but not just, we might have had some picture at some point of it. It's not just about the fancy tea culture or Japanese tea ceremony, as people might think. It's actually about tea around the world and both the good side and the rather dark side of colonialism and all that tea means and how tea gets to you. And it's not also the idea of just encouraging people to have nice and fancy teacup. We're actually hoping that's not what we did, because what we hope to encourage is the message of peace and that tea is about being together, it's a chance to talk, it's a chance to exchange ideas, exchange culture, and understand one another, rather than to fight or discriminate. So when this magazine came to life, we did 500 copies at first, that sold within, I think, two months. We were very surprised, because it seemed very niche to us. Then we realized there was a community around this, we did it in the second issue, which also had 2,500 copies and sold out rather quickly. And we realized there was really a community for this and people were coming to our events. We had a few talks and events like in Tokyo, in England, and I think Belgium with friends. So I'm really thankful to all the people that opened up you know, to, to receive us and do this project with us. And doing this made me realize that this was a magazine. So it was something people still had to pay for. You know, had to buy, it was a material object. And doing the garden drawing club is very different, but of course comes with different sets of challenge. Because while the drawing is a product that we're selling at the end of the day, we, we give some away to the students, to library, it remains a product. And the Garden Drawing Club is a community with, I think, a set of ideas and building values and, and hoping, I think everybody who comes, I hope, in some way goes back to their life with maybe something a little different and they might found an own project and it's kind of, I think, a sort of movement. And that's what I love about it and that is very different to the, to the tea magazine. But both intertwined because at the Garden Drawing Club we drink organic tea, it's always free, and you know, so there is some sort of connections as well. And what's your own kind of personal connection with tea? Kind of what's the, the role it has like in your, in your life and how, because it's interesting, but the region that you came from, from Alsace and the role there you were, you were describing. So my grandparents grew all their like the tisane as well. So we call tisane uh, herbal teas, and so they were growing a lot of them, and we were always drinking them, and I always found them very beautiful. Like some is calendula, that is very orange, and I recall my grandma's hand layering them on like kind of a cotton cloth and drying them, and always she used to say you have to pick them when the sun is bright in the sky in the middle of the afternoon. So I grew up drinking all those teas. But they were, sorry, they were not tea, they were tisans. They were, actually, I didn't drink real tea of the Camellia sinensis plant until I was about 
16 when I was in the city and I asked my mom, can we please go to the Asian shop? Because I really wanted to drink green tea. You know, I never had some, so I was really curious. So that's how it started, but like this journey with tea. And then I obviously got to discover like, you know, all the sort of green tea and then all the culture behind just green tea and the difference of, you know, Japanese green tea, Korean green tea, Chinese green tea, and all this history of also then Indian tea, like Tulsi, Masala Cha, and all this, all this culture. And I just became more and more curious because I realized this thing I had as a child where, so in my grandmother's house, we were drinking the tea that they grew, but she would tell me how she would drink the very same tea with her grandma. And I always thought that time almost didn't exist in that moment because I was with her and she, she was me, sort of like it was like going on and on and on. And I kind of loved that. And I think that tea really has this power because it is not at all a modern technology. It's just something we had always, and it's a nice continuous thread, and it keeps doing the same thing to two people being together. And we really love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a really nice like lineage um, through that kind of a material me memory, but also like a, a sensory thing. And if there's anyone um, here like listening to this that wants to know more about these things, about about the tea, about permaculture, about deep ecology. Um, art therapy are there and what, what would you advise like for people that want to know a bit more to get into it I think going to the library there is internet but internet can be overwhelming because there is so much but just going to a free public library I think they are so underused and they are such great roses they are free and actually just grabbing a book about deep ecology or a, a gardening book about permaculture or even I didn't mention in this talk but um, natural farming so from Masanabu Fukuoka I think is very inspiring just having this one book not getting overwhelmed with like 10 pages open on your browser, <laughs> you know, like, because actually we're going to remember nothing of that or just two words. We're just grabbing one book, keeping it for the four weeks or whatever you can learn it and renew it. I think it's going to stick with you so much more and, you know, than actually like going online. So that would be my advice. And I'm just going to events. There's so many free events. Come to the Garden Drink Club, you know, like we have a, also a free library that you can use. I mean, there's all, all these things. Yep, that you could do. When is the next one, actually? Do you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, so the next one in London is in June. It's a Thursday. It's at Pittsanger Manor Park and Gallery. It's on a Thursday evening. But they're all on our website. Then we have one in July at the uh, Omved Garden in London as well. So there's one or two per month. <laughs> that, that's busy. Um, thank you so much, Joanna. I think we've got time now just for like two questions ish. Um, if anyone. Uh, would like to ask anything. Yeah, are you, do you need a mic or do you want to just say it and I'll... No, I feel like I yeah. probably suggest that. Um, so growing up in the country... Oh, you got one. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, growing up in the country as well, I feel like it was a hindrance on my kind of creative thought process. So do you feel like growing up in the country going to the city, then coming back to the country is a hindrance on the way your kind of brain develops ideas? Or do you feel that it's less hungry for ideas? Because I find I get less creative when I'm at home in the country. But when I go somewhere, I'm more kind of eager to d digest things. I think it kind of, did everybody hear the question? Yeah, so thank you for the question. <laughs> I think it's good because I have the tendency to have a bit too many ideas. And my husband is really nice, like, you know, he listens to all of them. <laughs> but, like, I think, like, <laughs> living in the countryside, I kind of get time to, like, process my ideas and, like, chill down a bit, because otherwise I'll be, like, too much. So I think that I have time, like, you know, to really delve in what I want to do, and, and it makes me realize, because city is so fast-paced, that it can make you feel like you don't have time, you run out of time, you're never going to do it. But being in the countryside, it's so much slower that... I feel like I will have time for it, and I just really try to make things grow the way I want them to grow. For example, the tea magazine, we're releasing the fourth chapter now. It was very important to me that it also reflects my belief in the material objects, so we're going to print it with vegetable ink rather than with chemical inks as they were before because we couldn't afford it, so we, could, we took time to raise the money for that, and you know that the object also reflects those ideas. So I think that life, actually now being older, I'm going to be 33, allows me for pace that is balanced and happy, I think. <laughs> Thank that you. It. Yeah, did that answer, answer your question? Um, does anyone else have a question at all? Don't be shy. Uh, yeah, at the back. The Could you 
So I can repeat it if you want, if you don't want to say again. So um, the question was, what one book would you recommend if you were going to recommend one book about permaculture, deep ecology? I actually brought one. I was hoping for that question. <laughs> thank you. I don't know you, but thank you. So there is actually <laughs> Penguin, really is that... Um, that <laughs> like a series of books last year, and there is one by Arnes who coined the term deep ecology, which is very small, because his book, honestly, I bought them to some of my friends, including my best friend, is like this thick, and I know it can be quite intimidating, and you're like, this is too much, but like this one from, from Penguin, just there is no point of no return. It's very short, it goes to the point, you don't have to become a fan or like, you know, anything, but it really like explain what it is, and so that's, and it only costs, I mean, only 4.99. You know, it's not like one of the other one, which are more in the 20 pound. You can go so to the that, library. And oh, you get can it. go to your library, yeah. Following and if your they don't have it, advice. Yeah. <laughs> and if, you, if they don't have it at the library, another thing you can do at the library, you can ask them to order books, so you can give them recommendation. So that's another thing you can do. So that so one is a good one. Look, um, we'll just give the title. Maybe we can um, yeah. to give, leave some resources. But yeah, there is no point of no return. And by Arne Nace, is that yeah. right? And it's pleasingly slim and lightweight as well. Um, we can have one final question. Um, is there any? Yep. Uh, wait, we'll just, a mic so is coming mic. to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, as a fellow gardener artist, I'm just sort of curious about, I guess with your paintings, maybe specifically what your artistic or art making processes like, you know, from from garden to canvas, maybe? The, the relation between them? Yeah, just how it how it works. Do you make time, you know, after being in the garden or is it more every week you sort of take stock of what you worked with and things so, like that? Thank you. I so I take out our photograph with my analog camera. I think some have passed. But I do go to the garden, I would say, almost every day. Also, in summer, because it's a need to water some of the plants, but also to really just refresh my mind. Like, it's a nice break. And seeing the plants are very inspiring. But then it's like, I think one nurtures the other. I think the way I plant uh, is very painterly in the color. Like, you know, I'm very choosing for one part of my allotment only has white yellow and pink tones, whereas another part only has other tones, so it's also, I think they're both very, very connected. And then when I paint, it's the same way, like I really pay attention to the textures, so, or uh, just my husband often jokes that when I look at the painting, I'm not looking like this, I'm looking like this, to see the texture of the painter. So I'm, I really love that, the same way I would look at a plant or something that is like, you know, here in person. So that's, I think that's the relation, and also there is a more practical relation I grow, some of the plants that I grow actually become pigment. And so I grew, for example, I paint on linen canvas. So just to see, because I was curious, how does linen grow? I grew linen while I still lived in London. I obviously didn't wave it to make a canvas because the weather doesn't allow for that. But you know, I just wanted to see. So there is always like a relation, like when I see that in some of the painting I might have bought, there is the, plant, the name of a plant, I will try to grow it and just see how much it takes or what does it look like, you know. So try to always observing both, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And I have a sketchbook, so in my shed at Dollartman, there is a little box with like a sketchbook and a few stuff to draw. Mm. Hope that answers it. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for You're the welcome. nice question. Um, yeah, we've run out of time. So thank you so much to Tate for inviting us to have this conversation and to everyone who's come to listen to <laughs> Joanna talk. Um, and thank you, Joanna. Thank you. I find you. your work really inspiring. You can follow her. Um, and sign up to you have a newsletter yeah. or yep and the gardening drawing club is um is the is the workshops that yeah. you run right um so you can follow those and and hopefully attend one in the near future so thank you very much <laughs> thank you thank you for coming <laughs>